what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.tv. My name is Alan Jackson and I am with Chris Fry. Together we are co-founders and co-directors of the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival out of Western North Carolina. And Chris, how are you doing today? Doing, doing good. Had a good Thanksgiving uh, in the midst of the holiday season now. Not quite yet Christmas, but we have just enough time to get things done before that holiday arrives, which is good. It is that <laughs> interesting time of the year. And, and I tell you, it's interesting time of year for several reasons. One, you know, with the holidays and, of course, you know, think about family plans and travels. For me, it's also an interesting time of the year because this is t- probably the time of the year where I see more movies Ah, than normal, you know, just because you've got holidays, you've got family, you've got opportunities to go. So, and plus I think sometimes the quality of movies starts to kind of increase a little bit as far as what we have the chance to go see in the theaters. Sure. Because we're getting close to the end of the year and Oscar season and all that. So, uh, that actually kind of leads into what we're going to do in today's episode, because at least one of the films we're going to talk about, I think is one that's probably going to be at least batted around in some circles when it comes to award season. We're going to start off our show with a review of the film Widows. That's the latest film from director Steve McQueen, starring Viola Davis. Uh, We're going to start with that film. That one is getting some buzz and some, you know, claim that that may carry into the award season. We'll have to see. We'll follow that up with a a review of the latest Coen Brothers film, uh, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which is available only on Netflix. I think it may be showing in a few theaters. It did have uh, a very, very limited, limited role, yeah. but it's pretty much a Netflix release is where people are going to see it. Right. Uh, from there, we'll move into some movie news. Chris and I both have some news items we want to kind of discuss or some topics of interest in the in the filmmaking world. And then we'll cap off our show like we always do with our recommendation of something we think you ought to check out if you have the chance. Uh, something worth watching or viewing, hopefully either on an online platform or some easy way to get to it. So, Chris, that's our plan for the show. Um, Are you ready to get started? Yes, let's do it. All right. We're going to go then first into our first review, which is the film Widows. You have no idea, do you? Or did you choose not to know? Your husband stole $2 million from me. This is about my life. This is about my life. And because it's about my life, it now becomes about yours. <laughs> my husband left me the plans for his next job. All I need is a crew to pull it off. Why should we trust you anyway? Because I'm the only one standing between you and a bullet in your head. Director Steve McQueen's previous film was 12 Years a Slave. We both, Alan and I both saw that. I believe we reviewed it here on the show. We did. Um, with this film, Widows, it's a crime drama slash thriller that uh, he is directing again with help from writer Gillian Flynn, who did Gone Girl, did the screenplay for Gone Girl, so and wrote the book for Gone Girl. So she's helping out the screenplay with this. Um, we've got a star-studded cast: Viola Davis, that you mentioned, Colin Farrell, Robert Duvall, Liam Neeson, Jackie Weaver, Michelle Rodriguez. Just lots, lots of people all over the place in this. It's for me, you would think, you know, it's kind of a surprise that Steve McQueen picks this as his next mm-hmm. project. Um, I'm not familiar. I've heard of his previous films, um, but I have not seen them. There was Hunger, Hunger and Shame and Shame, and mm-hmm. haven't seen either one of those. But um, neither have I. They don't seem to really fit into what this film is going into as far as like a heist film or a thriller, a drama. So, Alan, what, having seen 12 Years a Slave and now seeing this, how do you feel like um, this fits with maybe what you know of director Steve McQueen and mm-hmm. how he his vision of films and kind of his style. Well, I, I always like it when a director seems to kind of step outside of a a style or a, a, a film genre that they've been kind of settled in. Sure. And even though you know, Twelve Years a Slave was a, a historical drama, 
And I know hunger is based on a true story, kind of has a little bit more historical relevance to it. Shame, I don't believe based necessarily on a true story. I think it was just a gentleman dealing with kind of a, more of a sex addiction uh, and some of the impact it had on the family members around him. This, this does sound different. But I also think it's great when a director says, hey, I want to try to dip my toe into this genre, but bring my sentimentalities to it, bring my style to it. And that's how I saw Widows came together. On the surface, you read the synopsis, it does not sound like a movie that this gentleman would make. But after watching the film, you're like, no, I totally get it. I, I understand what he was bringing to the table with this. And one of the things I like the most about this film is just the overall capable direction. Mm -hmm. Saying, all right, I'm going to make a, a heist film. And it's an interesting premise of a film. You know, you have basically just like the title insinuates, it's widows. It's women who were married or significant others were criminals and they died. And now the widows are left and they're finding out that there's some a price on their head because of money that was owed to other people in the community. And, and what are they going to do about it? And again, on the surface, it does not sound like a a film that you know a filmmaker like Steve McQueen would make, but the relationships he builds, the the style of direction, um, just the way he unrolls the story, I think is very much in his wheelhouse, and it does explore a lot deeper themes than just we need to go get this money so we can pay off mobsters, you know. Um, <laughs> right. So I think the direction of the film is something I did really admire. I mean, it's a very capable hand managing this film. And I love the story. I love the concept of the story. I think if you boil that story down, it's a really interesting story to to explore. I had issues with the film. Okay. But I think overall it was a strong film. Um, and I can get into more of the specifics, but I'm sure. kind of curious to hear your thoughts. I, I liked it. I didn't love it. And I was kind of disappointed in myself that I didn't love it. And I'm still trying to wrestle with why I didn't love it. But I think I've got some reasons why. Um but I will say from the story and the actual overall direction of the film, I think it was really strong. So that being said, Chris, what, what's your thoughts on this film? What, what did you take away from it? So, you know, you, you mentioned kind of if you read the synopsis of this film, you wouldn't have picked Steve McQueen to do it. And basically we've, you know, it, it's set in contemporary Chicago. And as you mentioned, there were some, some bank robbers, some robbers, some criminals. They die. Their widows are then said, okay you basically owe this debt to some people they were doing a job for you. You need to make this right. And they're like, mm -hmm. well, we're just widows. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we're, yeah, we're not in this, this world. Like, right. what, what's happening? Um, so, but in general, still it's like you, you would read that and think, okay, yeah, the whole film is then kind of bonding together, becoming like a ocean's 11 team. And then they're going to go do this heist. And you would f just feel like it'd be very formulaic and not interesting. Um, the strength of this film for me was that there was a lot more to it than that. Mm -hmm. The runtime is, I think, about two hours, a little over two hours, two hours and nine minutes. Um, that being said, the heist, if you can call it that, doesn't take place until the last maybe 15 minutes of the film. And I didn't feel, you know, I'm, a lot of times I belabor on this podcast how I feel like films could have been edited or they needed to trim it down because there was just a lot of fat in there and it mm -hmm. needed to make it leaner. I felt like this movie, because of the, the acting and because of what was going on, totally justified its runtime and i wasn't frustrated by the the heist that did happen towards the latter the, in the you know, mm -hmm. back half of the back 15 minutes of the film um and i thought things that happened during that were interesting there were also which i you know wasn't going into expecting from a steve mcqueen film just because I, I don't know just wasn't expecting it there are twists i guess mm -hmm. we can call it that that we will not go into or spoil because if you haven't seen the movie I want you to enjoy it that I was surprised that we're in there as well as there's a twist that is basically, I mean, it, it's put right in front of your face. And then instead of kind of saving it, which is what you would think, or like a complete reveal, instead of just a tease, they go ahead and give you a reveal of something that they oh, yeah. very well could have saved. Mm. And that's maybe halfway through the film. Yeah. And you're like, huh, interesting, but just a choice of doing that. But then what that kind of means, I, I don't know. It was just, very interesting directorial choices that were made that I really appreciated. And from, from the opening five or 10 minutes yeah. of the film, I felt like I was watching something by like Martin Scorsese or something, because you could just really, like you were saying, I could really feel like I could tell the directorial hand at mm -hmm. work and just, yeah. you know, crafting this thing. And you're like, okay, this 
even if it is nothing, which I don't, I feel like it's something more than just your typical heist movie or crime thriller. You're like, this is going to be a solid film. It's just Mm -hmm. because there's a very assured hand and it's going to be good. And it ended up being a little bit more than what I would say was a stereotypical film. I will say Mm -hmm. I did like it. I think I may have liked it a little more than you from the vibe I'm getting. However, um, I did feel like sometimes there was a lot going on (laughs) that was a little muddy and it didn't hurt the film but it just became kind of minor frustrations. And then I learned afterwards because I hit the Google that basically this was based on like a mini series. Yeah. And because of that, I think instead of stripping away more, they went ahead and kept it in there to kind of keep. And sometimes maybe it's, you know, on purpose for like misdirection and there's so much going on. You're not really sure because the characters are kind of confused. You're confused. And that's kind of an intent, but Maybe it was a little muddier than it should well, have been. Shaggy was the word I had on my dislikes. Shaggy. I felt like it, that was my number one complaint with the film is I, I felt like it was trying to do too much with too many smaller subplots that I don't think really benefited uh, the film in the end. I'll use one for example. Okay. Um, there is a, there is some flashback sequences and discussions and a small subplot about uh, the character Viola Davis and her husband uh, was played by Liam Neeson. You understand that they had a son who was shot uh, by a policeman uh, during a a routine traffic stop. It was really shockingly well done that sequence, but I don't feel like it really added anything to the film. You know, it didn't, it didn't, it was just an example. It did not to me contribute anything to what we already saw as motivations for her character and his character early in the film. You know, it just didn't add a lot. So, but I felt like there were maybe three or four of those little subplot things or little storylines with the different characters that just didn't add up mm-hmm. to the big picture. And, and it's not that I was concerned about running time. I'm fine with the running time. It's, sure. I felt like, unfortunately, anytime we took little detours in some of these other plot lines or uh, flesh out these other characters, we were losing what we could have been spending more on. I think the parts of the film that really worked really well, um, I think Viola Davis was great as Veronica. She's yeah. amazing. Very, very good. And I really, really liked Elizabeth Del Becky, um, her role as um, Alice, one of the widows as well. Those two had really interesting plot lines, and I liked every moment we kind of followed them. Mm-hmm. When it diverted a little bit more, uh, unfortunately, I, I just I don't think Michelle Rodriguez and her role really worked for me. And kind of her storyline, I think, was part of that shagginess that just didn't work as well. I can see that. We spent a lot of time with two warring factions of, you know, political, uh, on the political side of things. Some of those just kind of stretched out a little bit more and kind of really didn't add to the big picture. So, yeah, shaggy is just the word I said. I, I wish it was a tighter film. I wish they had focused a little bit more on some certain characters and storylines and really played more with those. Sure. Um, I will say for me, the film was starting to lose steam and I was kind of getting a little worried about it until the one twist you mentioned Hmm. kind of midway through the film or a little bit more than midway through the film. At that point, that kind of resharpened the focus for me. And I'm like, oh, okay, now this this is an interesting wrinkle. And I got reengaged in the film a little bit more. And um, but I do think up to that point, I was starting to get a little worried that it was just kind of sprawling a little too much and wasn't as focused as I thought it could be. So. Hmm. Um, so that's my biggest takeaway. I, I think, I think it was really good. I just, uh, it didn't quite meet the high expectations. Unfortunately, I probably went in with just all the buzz it's getting. And I do think that shagginess of the, of the storytelling was probably the main reason why. Well, I think, yeah, it was a little shaggy. The political stuff was interesting because you had Colin Farrell running for office and his mm-hmm. father, Robert, du- played by Robert Duvall, also has some political stuff going on as well. And the interactions between them was interesting. Oh, yeah. And obviously, mm-hmm. you know, the son wants to get out from under the shadow of his father, who's obviously been around for a while and done a lot of things. And that's where some of the, you know, criminal dealings kind of come in a little bit. And then you have the opposite side of people running against him and um, the the Mannings. So mm-hmm. there's uh, Jamal Manning, who's the guy I think that's running. And then he has a brother who's kind of his... <laughs> Henchman, which yeah. <laughs> interestingly, um, Daniel, Daniel Kaluuya, Kaluuya yeah. who, who's the guy from Get Out, um, and you know, totally playing a completely different. Oh, I yeah. would have never thought of him as being playing somebody who's menacing. And man, 
And, you know, he's, it's not that he's really tall or he's a big guy, no. but something about, you know, he his really face, <laughs> instead of making his face kind of this blank slate, <laughs> he just kind of has this like little leer on his face and this evil twinkle in his eye. That's oh. just, man, he's there is intense. a scene <laughs> in a gym Oh yeah, that is extremely intense and Daniel Kaluuya played it so well. So yeah, yeah it was probably one of my favorite moments of the film, that scene in the gym, just, uh, you know. I wanted more tension like that throughout the film. There were a couple of moments that were very tense, but that one was probably a little bit of a peak for me there. So he was really strong as well. I agree. I didn't, I think one of the, you know, there were a lot of things I liked. I liked him being the heavy man. So I liked, yeah. but you know, that thread overall, I felt like it could have been a little tighter. Mm-hmm. Robert Duvall and Colin Farrell, interesting stuff going on, but then in the end all be all, it just kind of gets, kind of gets fuzzy. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it still worked for me. The one thing that I didn't really get, and maybe you can provide a little bit more insight, mm-hmm. um, as far as the team of widows. Yeah. So you have Viola Davis, who's you know her husband died. Michelle Rodriguez, her husband died. Elizabeth Debicki, her husband died. Yep. Now, instead of going the typical route, mm-hmm. <laughs> and there would be a fourth widow. Oh, and her husband died, and that would be the person that's immediately on this team. Not the case. No. Nope. Um. They have somebody who she's a friend. I'm, I was kind of unclear. You see, that was part of the shagginess where it started to get a little bit. I'm like, okay, I'm not quite sure what the connections are here. And it's it's not really clear. She works at a hair salon. Yeah, that but had, she was doing some babysitting or right, something. For Michelle they, Rodriguez. And they I realized think. that she had some skills that they could use. And that, that, was, that was a little – that was really a big contributor to the to – the, I felt like it got muddied. Okay. Um, they brought her into the group. I wasn't quite clear why. Right. Um, another element to the sh- to the kind of the storyline I think just didn't work. There's there's this idea of a book that the Liam Neeson character who played you know plays uh, Veronica's husband Harry Rawlings who died at you know this is not a spoiler because I mean I think it's the whole premise of the film. Right. They all die in the beginning of the film right. uh, early on in a heist that's gone terribly wrong and. Uh, he leaves behind a book that we're led to believe he has left behind for his wife to find because he gives her a clue to go find it. And, um, the meaning of that book and the role that book plays is another part of the storyline I thought was really muddy. I mean, I, I, it interesting. I, it, it, it plays a role that it, it gave Veronica a path to take or a choice she could have made to, get out of the situation that she chooses not to take and it. I'm still questioning why she didn't take that path and how that would have been a cleaner resolution for her. But anyway, it's some of those things that just made the story a little more chaotic. Okay. I think the more I've, since you mentioned that this was based on a mini series, this would be a perfect mini series because you could explore all those aspects and all those characters a lot more and have a lot more fun with it. Trying to cram into two hours, I think was a lot. And, um, uh, that's probably part of the reason I, I got a feeling there was probably a longer cut initially that got trimmed down to just try to get it down to a reasonable length. And, um, unfortunately some of the things that might've made some of those plot lines a little more clear and those roles a little clearer might've, might've been fleshed out more in that situation. You mentioned that, um, we've kind of touched on a lot of the acting. The one that I haven't touched on that you did was Elizabeth Debicki. I don't, I recognized her and I wasn't sure from where. And apparently looking online, I guess it was some Guardians of the Galaxy volume mm-hmm. two where she plays the one that's all coated in gold and, you know, makes a few well, funny Did you comments. see the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio Great Gatsby? I did, but who was she in that? She was in that as well. Okay, so because I um, remember Carrie Mulligan because she right. was like the main mm-hmm. girl. But yeah, this uh, Elizabeth Debicki was a supporting okay. uh, player in that film as well. Got a lot of acclaim for her performance uh, okay. there. So yeah, um, but yeah, she was she was kind of a an interesting standout for me. She was strong. a nice surprise. I've yeah. just never really paid attention to her as an actress, but yeah, she was she was very good. She played Jordan Baker in The Great Gatsby. For oh, okay. I never saw the film, but in case you okay, recall right. that, that's yeah. that was her. Um, I'll say a couple of other things I really liked. Um, specific moments. I thought the opening sequence of the film was really well done. It was a a lot of cuts between very uh, very intimate, very uh, strong relationship uh, scenes between Liam Neeson and, and Viola Davis, intercutting with this 
uh, this this heist or this this crime that goes terribly wrong, you know, for the gentleman in the story. And it's the way that's cut between it just it was a nice balance. It really was kind of a, an interesting way to show it. I love the fact the very first shot we see is the two of them laying in bed kissing. And it's just you know, it just enough moments where the director says, all right, I'm just going to kind of keep everybody engaged in this film and let everybody know from the very first shot. This is not going to be a typical just action heist film. Sure. We've, we've got a lot more going on to discuss here, which I thought was great. Um, and I, I love the the absolute closing of the film uh the very last like shot or scene to me was just it was a nice closing to a film you know so many films drop the ball with that last scene or that closing and here we have an epilogue where you know you kind of understand where the characters are now at least two of them anyway right and we close on just a shot of viola davis i thought was just really nice and just kind of worked true or false except in flashbacks as far as the current Stuff we're seeing with her character. That's the first time we see her smile? I think so. Okay. Which is what I think works. Yeah. So, no, you it, know. It, it does. Yeah. Um, I'll say, too, you know, we've... Well, a genuine smile. A genuine said. smile. Yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked a lot about the movie. You know, I've mentioned, I felt like you could see the assured hand of the director as well as, you know, the editing was really tight. Cinematography was really good. Yeah. And one that sticks out in my mind. Um, and it, something about it, I'm not sure... Maybe just because it felt real and it kept a conversation that would have been interesting probably anyway, but something just about the way they shot it made it very, I don't know, otherworldly, but yet real at the same time. Basically, it's a conversation between Colin Farrell and his associate after they've just been at a rally and they get in a car and it starts at Mm -hmm. one side of the car, outside of the car. Okay. So instead of a conversation where you see like some person driving or they're going back and forth talking, talking heads, no. This is the outside of the car, a very nice car, and they start on one side and they leave one type of neighborhood and then it slowly kind of pans around the front of the car and comes to the other side and then they get to their eventual location and they get out of the car and it's in this really nice neighborhood, I guess in front of his house, Mm -hmm. I think is where it is. Just that scene and kind of what it communicates just visually, but also the dialogue, like that was... That was amazing. A lot of people pick, like to me, a lot of people will talk about the shot in Atonement. That's like the dot yeah. or the, you know, the long uncut shot on the beach, mm-hmm. or they talk about the shot in children of men that happens in a car. And it's like this one continuous shot, this shot for me. And usually a lot of times I'm, I guess if a film's good, I may be so invested in it. I don't really notice things like that. Mm-hmm. This film, I was invested in it, but I guess maybe just the way it was set up. Well, it was such a unique shot. It was a unique shot. Even I'm there. I mean, my wife, who's, you know, uh, goes to see some of these films with me immediately, like afterwards, mentioned that shot because it is something that just stands out to people. It's not a showy shot. Like some of the ones you mentioned as examples, those continuous one takes. It's more what this shot was telling you through a very simple camera movement and a very interesting camera placement is what made it really interesting. So there's definitely a lot this film's trying to say about, you know, uh, communities and about, you know, uh, kind of, uh, the, the, the different sides of political divides that, that, that we are put ourselves in sometimes, um, the roles of women, you know, in, in these, in these relationships, there's a lot to say. And I think that may have been a little bit to the detriment of the film. that's trying to do too much. Okay. And, um, too ambitious, maybe. too ambitious again, like the subplot with the sun is just had a lot to say with that, but yet, those, it was just more added onto the film that I don't feel like it really needed. I mean, I think the okay. the main plot line of the film wasn't had enough going on with it without having to add these other layers to it along the way. So, okay, I did like it. I, I think the one actress, Michelle Rodriguez, I just I just did not think her <laughs> role worked. I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm waiting for a good role for her to really see her act. I just felt like she's still very much. A lot of the roles she's given, it's a very one note character and hers was probably the, my least impressive performance in the film. I thought everybody else was really solid. I, really yeah, I, I can see that. Um, yeah. I really like her, I guess, from when she was in lost. <laughs> so I was hoping that this would be a little bit more yeah. kind of meaty for her, but yeah, it just didn't. Well, and I've never seen her work. really in many of the fast and furious movies or anything like that, oh, but you're not a big fast and furious. No, fan. she's, it, but it still seems like a very similar character style I for her. You. And I just, I'm, I like I like when actors and actresses kind of step outside and try something a little different. Now I could argue Viola Davis 
plays a lot of this same role too. I mean, she's <laughs> there are moments in this film where she's very similar to how she played in what was that Suicide Squad movie? Yeah, yeah. you know, or not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But she's in that. again, she's got that part so nailed down right. and so good. It's Kinda just like so the, much fun to I'm watch. Calling no the shots. I'm all yes. business. Yeah. I got uh-huh. you. But you know, even with Viola Davis's character here, there was enough moments of vulnerability in her own personal self-confidence shaking that you find that you realize that made it an interesting character. She just wasn't a tough as nails. I've got control over this situation. She tried to personify that and tried to show that in her actions because she had to. Sure. But you saw enough behind the scenes to understand, no, that's that's a little bit of a performance she's having to put on for these other people to get what she needs out of the situation. So it was a great performance regardless. So good. So we're both recommending it. You seem to be a little more high on it than I am, but I I think we both share some of the same disappointments with it as far as it it not being as tight or as uh, clean as it could have been from a, from a film standpoint, but it's definitely worth seeing. I think it is worth being in the Oscar discussion for some, I think direction would be interesting. I think Viola Davis for actress would be interesting. I could see um, DeBecky being supporting actors. I could probably. see that as well. I'd be really happy with that. Even Daniel Kaluuya as a supporting actor yeah. could be something yeah. there that would be an interesting yeah. role. So it's got enough going on there. I think that's worth being in the discussion. But uh, I will say I probably went in with maybe a little higher expectations than I should have. So and obviously I wouldn't be upset if it got in there for cinematography. But yeah, who knows? no, because it was good on that as well. So all right, well that's Widows. It's a uh, Doing pretty good box office wise, considering you know it's a rated R drama crime film, and uh, so we do recommend checking it out if you have a chance. All right, let's move on to our second review, which is the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, the latest film from the Cone Brothers. That is a Netflix almost exclusive film, uh, and let's go ahead and talk about it. I'm Buster Buster Scruggs. You're shooting iron work. <laughs> Appears to do, yes. Things have a way of escalating out here in the West. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. That man is a wonder. I will just have to see you only. Ah, crazy business. <laughs> First time. <laughs> Chris, I know we discussed several months back the fact that the Coen brothers had a new film coming out that was going to be going straight to Netflix. Yes. Which I I reacted with some trepidation. I mean, I'm, the whole going straight to Netflix thing still concerns me because my question with that is, well, is it that the film's not good enough to get a theatrical release and just it was not, uh, convenient for Netflix to buy it? Or is it truly something designed more for a – TV home experience as opposed to a theatrical experience. I don't, I never know. And I'm still curious about the whole Netflix films. That's a whole nother topic for another day we can get into. Sure. Netflix has had a tons of original movies. They've been putting out the last few months right. with mixed results. And so this one, I'm, I was curious about more curiosity than anything else. But with this film, the ballad of Buster Scruggs, we have an anthology film, which basically taking six stories of varying lengths together all around the same theme of the old West and kind of the same time period, but not really any connection between them, unless we want to follow along a theory I have about the film that we can discuss later on. (laughs) But in other words, six fairly independent storylines with different actors and, 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 uh, and stories going on. It is directed by the Coen brothers, both Ethan and Joel, and they both have director credit on the film, which is normally they've had to kind of trade off. Because based it's a on Hollywood thing, it's a Hollywood it? thing, yeah. I think for awards or whatever else, you kind of have one director named and, and I don't know if that's still the same situation now, but I thought it was nice to see that both of them were listed as both directors and writers of, mm-hmm. of this film. We have a whole list of stars because each of them plays a role in one of the six films, but there's no carryover between them. So each one has a 15 to 20 minute film that they're a part of. Right. So my question to you, Chris, is I know we're both Coen Brothers fans. I think you are a higher level Coen Brothers fan than I am, possibly. But we're both big fans. Sure. Um, We're both excited to see this film. So my question to you to start off is the choice to put this on Netflix. Do you feel like this film would have worked in a theater environment? 
So let's just start with that. I'm curious about your thoughts about the, the style and the format of the film. And then we can get into a what we liked, didn't like. And maybe we even kind of quickly hit each of the six stories and talk about likes and dislikes on each of those as well. But I wanna, I'm just curious. Do you feel like this film, the format it was in, this anthology, six different storylines, and the style and the pacing of the stories, do you think it would have worked as well in a theater environment? Or do you are you happy it came to a Netflix watch on your own convenience type of format? Well, that very complicated question. Um, I am happy it came to Netflix because that meant I happened to subscribe to Netflix. (laughs) So -hmm. that means it was really easy for me to watch this. (laughs) You could watch it basically the same time as the rest of the world. Right. And I didn't have to go to a theater's carve out time. It was like, you know, as long as I have a computer near me or Mm -hmm. in front of my TV that took up, I'm, I'm set. So just the ease of which to watch the newest film from some of my favorite directors, that was really nice. Yeah, and will it would it have worked better in a theater? I'm not really sure. There's a lot of really beautiful cinematography, mm-hmm. and you know, of the old west, and that would have been nice. Yeah, to see on the big screen in a theater with really good sound. So would, but I feel like you know, six different stories, two hour, thirteen minute runtime. I feel like it probably does work better on Netflix I than it does in, I agree. in the theater because. Like you mentioned in your setup, there is not like when I originally heard about this, because we've talked about this on the news yeah. items for that, you know, because we were I was excited about it. I thought the stories would somehow <laughs> interweave kind of like a Robert Altman film or something or they would. Maybe not, they do. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we'll, we'll get there. We'll but get there. I, yep. I thought it would be a little bit more. The connective tissue would be Ooh. a little bit more obvious. And I, I think agree. if that was the case it would help in a theatrical distribution because it would kind of keep it more cohesive as a whole. Yeah. Um, for me, I like the film, but where it kind of fell apart was I based of the six, I definitely have some favorites Yeah. and the ones that aren't my favorites. I really feel like they're just, there's not really much to they're them. Very and they slight. Kind of, they're very slight. And because of that, I'm, I would feel like in the theater, it'd be like, okay, just get on to the next one. Yeah. Um, and I'll say before we get into specifics, there is one in here that I have seen two or three times. And I, if I had like a couple of minutes or I knew somebody that was a Coen Brothers fan who didn't have Netflix, I'd be like, Hey, come here. You got to check this out. Mm-hmm. There's one that I would watch, you know, okay. I'm as guess, many times I'm as have I to guess could, which one that's going to be in a I, here. I love it. And as okay. a matter of fact, I'm down okay. to two choices okay. that I think it is. And we'll <laughs> see if I'm right on either of those. Okay. I agree that I think this was the right format to release it in and to okay. put it out in. There were rumors and the Cone brothers have just have said no. Right. There were rumors. This was going to be like a series on and Netflix. I could see how, okay, they do six episodes. So be it. I don't think it would have worked. I think as individual episodes, if you were just watching one of them as an episode, I don't think you would get anything out of it. Right. I think you'd probably watch two or three of them and be like, yeah, I'm not enjoying this. But watching it as a singular thing is good, mm-hmm. but it's a singular thing with the breaks and kind of you, you can feel like you could go back and revisit some parts of it and you're okay to do that. Right. I think in a theater, it would have been really tough. And I don't think this would have made any money in right. a theater either because it's just some of the, some of the, some of the pieces are, are pretty slow, like slow paced. Some of them really take their time getting to where they're well, going. Good. I, I see where you're going. It sounds um, like we're really on the same page. <laughs> yeah. Some of them really take their time. Uh, some of them are very slight. Like you said, we're at the end of it. If I, if I'd sat down to watch an episode of this you series like, yeah, and I finished okay. the episode, I'd be like, ah, that, that didn't work for me. But as a, if I watch it as one big block of film, yeah, it, I liked it. I had a good time with this. I think I probably liked it a little more than you did. Cause I actually okay. found something to enjoy in almost all six of them, there's only one that just didn't work for me in general. Hmm. Um, and okay. I definitely had a favorite as well. Okay. So one that I actually do want to go back and watch again. Okay. Well, so do you want to start ticking them off? And we can do this without spoiling. I feel oh, like, yeah. you know, I feel sure. like each of these little stories does have some spoiler elements we could get into. Let's not. Let's just talk about in general the overall topic of the the short film. Sure. Who's in it and what we what we liked or didn't like about it. So. All right, so let's go first into the very first one. We we'll just do them in the order they were in the film. Yeah, okay, that works fine for me. The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. So this is the titular uh, character. It is Tim Blake Nelson. Um, I did think it was interesting that you named the whole film the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, but he's just in the first film. Correct. 
and he's not anywhere else in the film. There's no carry through. There's no mention of him. I thought that was an interesting choice. Agreed. Um, and it, it kind of led me to believe that he was going to be somehow woven into some other stories, but he was not. And even even the movie poster yeah. leads you to believe that because it's you see six different, like there's a horse, there's a carriage, and you, like you see, and it looks like all roads are leading to the title of the film, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. So it kind of, you know, leads you to believe that things will be tied together, but no. And we'll get to my theory at the okay. end. But, um, um, and so Ballad, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, yeah, he's, he's basically a... Um, gunslinger yeah and it follows him and um it's a very <laughs> cohen-esque um yeah. take on a gunslinger on the old west combining elements of i guess maybe oh brother oh brother where art thou which tim blake nelson was in as well um well you have some music yep you have it's probably the most violent it absolutely the is six, the most violent yes. um which is shocking it you is. know starting out the movie with a singing, a cowboy, a dress in all white that looks like he just walked off a Hollywood movie set. Mm-hmm. But it's actually the most violent uh, segment of the whole film. I liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a jarring start to the movie, you know. But um, but I was okay with it. And I, I just I had fun with it in general. So yeah. this wasn't your favorite though, right? Oh, do you want to, do you want to review, go down and talk about all of them and then I'll state which one or do you want me to, do you want to, well, when we, when we, <laughs> when we get to it, you tell me which one, sure. Your, oh, your this favorite. was my favorite. That was your favorite. Absolutely. Okay. You had a good time with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's probably my second favorite. I, oh, I enjoy it. I have a good time with it. I just, I love the breaking out into song in the bar after, uh, Surly Joe. Yes. Yeah, Surly <laughs> Joe. I, and the shot and the, just the, the shot, the framing of the, how Surly Joe, Met his end. Oh my God. <laughs> so classic. They're so like, okay, here's the thing. And we'll continue on with the other ones. I had seen this. I'd seen this first part. Actually, I think I'd seen the first two. And then my family was like, you know, kind of rumbling through the, the den. And then I was like, Oh, what are you watching? I was like, well, this is what it is. <laughs> and my wife was like, Oh, I'll watch that. I was like, okay, well, we can watch it from the beginning. He's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll start over. And my daughter was like, it's at the old West. I'm like, yep. And I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. Granted, I had not seen the whole film, but only seen the first two. I was like, sit down and watch the first one. And if you don't like it, you can get up and leave. No harm, no foul. Part of the nice thing about an anthology film right. is that you can't actually get up and leave. She watched that first one and she was like, all in. Invested for the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, that, I just. Well, but don't you think, think it was a little bit of a shame oh, that, you know, the fact that, that the tone it set with that first oh, one yeah. is never matched in the no. rest of the film. And it was, to me, you know, you said this was your second best. This was my favorite. And I was like, oh, my goodness. If this is maintained, <laughs> this is going to be my favorite Coen Brothers film. Yeah. This is going to be my favorite film of the year. Oh, yeah, you're probably, <laughs> probably somewhat disappointed when you got later in the film. Yes. So, yeah. but I. I cannot recommend the first segment ballad of buster scruggs enough i loved it <laughs> okay well cool i it was my second favorite okay. i'm looking uh, forward did, to finding out i, which is your I did like it i thought it was a lot of fun and it was definitely the most zany coen brothers uh, you know the closest to uh i mean i don't want to say big little it's not the closest to big little it's hudsucker proxy kind of absurdist a little bit well, it, you it know and just I, I think i think big lebowski but with more of a Hudsucker proxy vibe. Yeah, it's it's their one of the rare attempts where they are just trying to be funny. Yeah. And it's right. just like they're just trying to be funny. Yeah. And I really enjoy their humor. A lot of times things get so dark, like in a serious man or inside Lewin Davis, I kind of lose kind of the fun of the film. Yeah. Whereas that first segment, the fun was never lost on me. Even True. though it was Tarantino like violence. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it, was it was pretty rough. Insane. Yeah. And my wife was like, oh, like turning away. I'm yeah. like, yeah, sorry, that was pretty violent. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, just it really it was amazing. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, from there we move on to one called Near Algodones. Uh it stars James Franco. He's a cowboy that you know, robs a bank, but then finds himself kind of hopping between some other precarious situations run from the law, <laughs> running from the law. This one, uh, it was the shortest, I think of all the, the, the clips. If I can, if I think my timing's right on it, I think you meant it was also probably one of the most slight ones for me. It just didn't really work. I, I mean, it was a fine little enjoyment thing coming off the first one. It, if this had been later in the film, I probably would have been more disappointed in it. coming off the first one. I'm like, okay, it's a little step down and, if nothing else, the last little moment of this this film was really great, but 
Um, <laughs> the la- that's interesting. The last moment was really great. Yeah, well, I mean, it just, I like the way it ended. I love the way it you. ended I with the you. last shot and the last uh, thing that, that the, his, his character says. But it was a, a fairly slight short film for me. So um, I, I, still, I still really enjoyed it. Not, it didn't live up to the first film, but yeah. it, was, it was still good. I still enjoyed it. And like you, where it ends, um, because they kind of set you up thinking that maybe something's going to happen. And then the dark humor of the Coen brothers oh, yeah. you know, rears its head. And you're like, nope, this is, <laughs> that's yeah. how they're going to end this. Yeah, so, it. yeah, I, I liked it. Sounds like a little more than you. But. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and maybe it's just me and James Franco. I'm still not uh, the biggest fan. So, understand. Yeah, that didn't work for me as much. Um, meal Ticket. So this is Liam Neeson starring. Uh, he plays a a gentleman who you know has a traveling show that you know he kind of goes from town to town and puts on these little performances. And his performance consists of a gentleman who has a quadriplegic, no arms, no legs, who recites beautiful oratory, you know, uh, some poems, uh, poems some and plays, and uh, Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address, I believe. Right. And he does that for performances, and you come to find out that. Over time, they're losing their audience, and uh, Liam Neeson's character feels like he has to make a change in his uh, <laughs> change in his performance options. Um, I'll say this one: I thought was beautifully shot. I love some of the, the the cinematography choices, and just it was a completely different tone from the previous two right. films. Boy, is it dark! Boy, oh, is man, it depressing! It's so dark. Um, but, you know, if you're going to go dark Coen Brothers, I thought it was pretty good in that vein. It's just, again, at that point in the film, I'm realizing that we're going to go all over the place on tone during this. This is not all going to be lighter sure. Old West stuff. This is this has got some heavy stuff in mixed in. And this one was definitely a, a heavy one. So, yeah. And I, I think this is, you know, I, even though I think it's unfair, you can say which one's your favorite, but to. I don't know. I th- this is my least favorite. Really? I th- well, <laughs> runner up for least favorite, maybe. <laughs> mm. um, and it, I, yeah, beautifully shot, well acted, but it, it all comes down to a story perspective. I felt like there wasn't a whole lot there. And the way it ended, I was disappointed that repercussions weren't visited upon one of the characters. Um, yeah. It had a dark tone, but I kind of wanted well, some comeuppance to happen. And it didn't. Exactly. There again, it's kind of the dark humor and kind of, but it just, I don't know. Yeah. It, le- it left me oh, a little. It, there, there's surprised. one shot they could have included at the very end of this film where the Liam Neeson character has this new thing that he's going to put on performance and to find out that new thing doesn't work. That probably would have been a little bit of that come up into where you right. start to feel like, okay, it becomes more of a parable at that point. Right. You know, and that's kind of what, yeah. because the first two kind of were at the this first, point. There, there's definitely some parables to it. This third one had the opportunity to be a parable and kind of didn't close the loop and on, it was on doing basically, it. Basically, I guess, you know, dark humor. Obviously, I'm a fan of the Coet Brothers. I can appreciate it. But I felt like this one was bleakness for bleakness sake. Yeah. And that kind of that kind of irritated me. It was kind of like, you know, we'd mentioned before when you feel like maybe you're being manipulated or, you know, you're, they're playing you like a violin and you feel like mm-hmm. they're doing it kind of unfairly. This one, I felt like I was being unfairly manipulated and then it was just bleakness for bleakness sake to depress me. And yeah. I was like, OK, you know? I, uh, this so. is my third favorite of the six. Wow. Just because <laughs> okay. I thought it was really it was well shot, well shot. And I was really just fascinated with where the story was going to go. I, I with you. Wish it would have chosen a different way to end it out. And it was at the end of it. You were just like, whew, okay, well, there's that. And you're ready to move on. But I thought during the ride of it, I thought I was pretty engaged. So. I, th- I thought you were going to say it was your favorite oh, no, because no. you really disliked Dudley from the Harry Potter series. And you were really excited that he finally got to come up. And Is that who it is? See, uh, the guy who plays the actor, the quadriplegic, yeah, is uh, uh, Harry Melling. And he plays Dudley in the Harry see, Potter. I, I'm not really a Harry that? Potter Guy, so because I, I, I was like, oh my gosh, that's like, dude, I've yeah. never seen him anything else. But he was really good. Though. He was no, he very, was. very good. Yeah. But yeah, it's a t- it was a tough watch. It's a it's a tough one, but I think just beautifully done. So I, I liked it for what it was. I, I wish it maybe had ended on a different note. True. Uh, but all right. So then we've got old 
gold, all gold Canyon, yes. which is basically Tom Waits mm-hmm. uh, uh, as a prospector, as a, yes. a guy digging for gold. Yes. And he finds a beautiful Canyon and he looks for gold and uh, he runs into some issues once he actually does find said gold. Um, what's your thoughts on this one? I, I liked it. And um, you know, the more I reflect on, this anthology and I can complain about some that I like less or more, or originally I was even kind of irritated at the placement mm-hmm. or the order of some of them. Yeah. You know, here I am second guessing the Coens. What am I doing? <laughs> but <laughs> this one I think couldn't have been more perfectly placed after the downer. That was Neil. Tickett. Yeah. Um, it was right in the middle. All gold Canyon. Yeah. It was the fourth story and it was kind of, that was a real downer before it. And this one kind of comes out and it, it's in this, you know, canyon that's this grassy meadow with, you know, flowers and little animal, you know, butterflies and deer and stuff. And it's just very, you know, pretty and stuff. Yeah. But um, so it kind of brings you up a little bit. I liked it. Yeah. Um, I really liked it. Um, yeah, I, I liked it. It's maybe, I don't know, the, you know, the first one, the second, and now this one are probably my favorites out of the whole bunch. Interesting. Um, huh. And two, it was funny. There again, sometimes watching it with other people brings you enjoyment that you wouldn't have had otherwise. <laughs> My daughter as this one was transitioning to the next film. Yeah. She's like, man, that guy's voice, he can't sing. I'm like, funny thing. though. <laughs> yeah. That guy's not. name is Tom Waits. He that is doesn't... known. He yeah. is a singer musician and he is known for that voice. So, but you know, even in the film, they kind of joke about that because it seems like it's like this, you know, perfect idyllic setting, but then all the the animals scatter when they hear mm. his voice. Like, oh my gosh! And were, so it's just like kind of this in joke, Playing and I that. made me appreciate that. So, what well, were your thoughts on it? Um, I liked it. Uh, the cinematography sold it for me. It was just a beautiful thing to watch, and uh, I loved the dedication of this guy. I, I it just you're watching the process of him mining for gold. I mean, it spends most of his runtime with him just looking for gold, which. May not sound terribly exciting, but it was actually kind of interesting to watch his process of mm-hmm. going through to try to find the vein he's looking for. Say good night to Mister Pocket. Yeah, Mister Pocket. <laughs> good night, Mister Pocket. Um, and it was a nice, interesting. I don't want to say surprise, but there was a moment where you're just like, "Oh, okay, now things have completely changed and turned." Right. And it turns once again, even uh, in that last moment. So uh, this was. A, I really liked how it ended. It did, and and it and it was yeah, it was like one of the few of, of these that ended positively happy. <laughs> happy so yeah right um which I, that okay that was the thing the first two i liked obviously i've said but there's kind of a dark and i was like okay we get to that third one not only did i not like how it ended but it was like it continues down this dark path and you're like okay we're over halfway through because we're starting on this yeah. fourth story is everything going to end <laughs> so dark and so depressing and no this one manages to kind of you know, bounce back up to the surface. It, it, of you know, it has the potential to be a downer ending and it doesn't, it, right. it turns on a dime and, and gives you some hope and feels a little better about it. So right. uh, I liked it. I thought it was good. Um, yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed it. It okay. was fine. So then we get to the gal who got rattled, uh, probably the longest one of the six. It felt epic. Okay. <laughs> All right. Are you saying that in a good way or bad way? Uh, I did revisit this now, uh, cause this one I did watch twice because yeah. I had such a low opinion of it the first time. Um, oh, Chris. Yeah. It, it, this is my favorite. Really? Yeah. I love I'm it. Now there's not, there is stuff that, it. there is stuff that I can appreciate, but to me, um, having seen the film, film, uh, Meek's Cutoff by Kelly Reichert, oh, right. which is about a wagon I train. I haven't seen that. This to me felt like I was just revisiting that film. No. Um, I appreciate the little attempts, you know, the, not attempts, the, the bits of humor that were in the film and they helped carry me. Mm-hmm. But every time it was serious, it just, I thought it was over long and tedious and kind of uh-huh. it, just like traveling in a wagon train probably was boring because, you know, it is kind of the same thing mm-hmm. over and over and over again. I'd had that kind of cinematic experience before. And so this wasn't bringing anything new. Well, and for Although me, president Pierce, funny name, president for Pierce is the dog was awesome. <laughs> Yes. And I'll tell you, so Bill Heck uh, uh, plays Billy Knapp, Billy which Knapp. they call Mr. Knapp. I thought he was great. I loved his good. character because he he's a he's a ranch hand. He's a he's helping this this uh, you know he's helping this what do they call this this uh, wagon train wagon train. Yeah, he's one of the two leading the wagon train or kind of running it. Sure, but his character was so fascinating to me because he just seemed like a good guy and just. <laughs> Really wanted to do the right thing for everybody around him. And, you know, you start to see a relationship develop between him and 
Alice Longabaugh, played by Zoe Kazan. Yeah. And it's such a nice relationship. It's so great. The the, the banter they had, the discussions. They, it starts out they're trying the, to work through a process. Work I think through. the problem was I just knew where it was going the whole time. So it See, seemed so telegraphed. I was but. hoping that after the last clip where we saw that ended on a positive scene, I was hoping this one would be a, a nice, happy story. It wasn't. No. Nope. Um, <laughs> it does end tragically. Yeah. I like the way it ended because it's a very – it was a very Greek tragedy type of type of situation. And if nothing else, the last moment of this story, and, and this is where I think it's interesting. We didn't mention that the whole movie is kind of uh, set up as like a book. You so we have a book motif through. where mm. you see somebody's leafing through this book. And every time we get to a nice painted image, that's of the next story. And then as the story ends, we pan, we go back to the book and there's actually a page of text, like the end of the story. And I don't know if you paused any of those to read some of those, the text at the end of the story. This one in particular really got me because, you know, and I don't want to spoil the film, but one of the characters that's left at the end of the story has to share some news to another character. And knowing the relationship that's been developed between these three characters that the main story follows, you know, this this is going to be a very difficult conversation to have. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of probably could be some suspicion about what really happened during this this event oh wow so the end the end little text is basically like him saying in the story is basically this character saying i have no idea what i'm going to say to this gentleman and that i'm like that that last shot i'm like oh perfect because it's not just the tragic ending it's now these two men are friends and something has just happened and he's going to have a really hard time explaining okay that that reading of Mm -hmm. that story Okay. Yeah, yeah. Remember the the two gentlemen, they were a little bit at odds about what was happening with this relationship. The one, the one older uh, 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 wagon hand was not terribly crazy about it. I, so you I know. didn't read this. I didn't read the story that way. But if that is true, that you know, the suspicion that could come because mm-hmm. of the event that happens and how <laughs> it has to be communicated, that actually would make me like this a whole lot more. I I never felt there was. Uh, just like disinterest, really. Mm-hmm. But if there is a, that's that's an interesting. Uh, that's how, that's what I got. Trying from to it. spoil anything. That's, that's, what that's I got a, from that's it. a very interesting. I just, read. I love. I thought the acting was great. Bill Heck and Zoe Kazan, really, really great characters. I enjoyed following them. Uh, you know, the dog was great. I mean, to me, this <laughs> was a, was this great. was a. All right, to me, this was a a Coen Brothers film. I love the dialogue that was presented throughout. I love the different characters we're introduced to. Uh, um, Alice had a brother that was kind of an interesting character we see in the <laughs> earlier half. Right. There's some people in a boarding house, I guess, where they're staying for the night, opening the scene that are also all very interesting mm-hmm. characters. It just it had enough Coen Brothers elements the, the as a complete story. The opening boarding house scene I really liked, yeah. and then it kind of got slow. But um, yeah, that's that's anyway, interesting. It was my favorite. I like that reading. Room. I yeah. like that. I don't know if it was intended or not, but I like that reading of how uh, it ends. I just thought it was my favorite, and yeah, it was a tragic, uh, depressing ending. But I still enjoyed the film. Okay. So that was the girl that got rattled, of the gal who got rattled. Gal. Yeah. So then we end with the last one, the mortal remains, which is uh, a stagecoach, where we are following five individuals in the stagecoach, all having conversations about you know who they are and kind of what. What's going on around them? It's a little mysterious. There's a lot of smoke and darkness, and we know that there is a dead body on the top of the stagecoach that two of the gentlemen are basically taking somewhere, I guess, as like a bounty, like bounty, you know, returning bounty hunters. Yeah. Uh, We never see the driver of the stagecoach, and they end up dropping the passengers off at a hotel at the end. That's basically it, unless you want to read a lot more into it, which I think you can. Um, this one I really had a tough time with. Uh, I, I wanted more out of it. Yeah, yeah. And I just, it's probably my least favorite only because I just wanted more. And I felt like it just gave me the glimpses of something interesting and not enough of anything interesting. Um, yeah, the Coens are good at writing. And I think I was kind of worn down by the one that came before it. Yeah. So when this one, it basically is kind of a, one room type thing, mm-hmm. hateful eight, except it's in a stagecoach instead of at a bar or whatever, or a little hotel thing. But it's all trapped in the stagecoach and it's all dialogue, so there's no action really. Yeah. And 
I felt kind of worn down and like there, there needed to be a little bit more to it. Now, that's not to say the performance, who I was not familiar with, has a really fun name, though. Mm -hmm. John Joe Mm O'Neill, who plays the Englishman. Yeah. Um, His persona Mm -hmm. in this is he was very bizarre, but was enough to kind of keep me interested. Mm -hmm. Um, Brendan Gleeson is also in this. He plays the Irishman. Mm That's how he's identified. Um, Tyne Daly as well. Um, You know, so it had some stars, but just something about there wasn't enough there and at the conclusion of the piece like you're saying you can kind of read certain things into it as what is the true the true gist of what is actually going on with the Mm -hmm. three people in the carriage as opposed to basically the irishman and the englishman kind of work together well they they say that as much but their true their true job in life (laughs) Mm -hmm. kind of maybe gets to be a little clearer maybe um i don't know but i just felt like it didn't the last two stories, they're going to have to get out my stopwatch. For me, just felt like they kind of overstayed their welcome for what they were trying to do. And it didn't help that they were back to back. But, yeah. you know. I uh, I wasn't bothered by the length of this one. It was more just, it was it was glimpses of ideas that really didn't amount to anything on its own. Although, gotcha. if you really want to get deeper reading into it, I think you could start to pull some ideas. Okay. Let me just... So get, this out is, there. It, is this when we're doing, are you going to give us your overarching theme of the entire anthology? Well, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and I'll do this without spoiling, I think, but okay. uh, just know that there is a death in each of the, the five preceding stories. Correct. Okay. Correct. A death. Now in four of the five, the death is of a, one of the main characters we're following. Correct. Okay. Correct. In the fifth story, the one that the main character, one of the main characters does not die. Somebody else dies. Okay. Okay. You following me? Yes. All right. So we've got a major death in each of the five preceding stories. Although in one of those five, it's not the protagonist we've been following. It's someone else. Right. Which, yeah, my wife had actually stayed. At one point, my daughter asked a question. She's like, yeah, well, whoever the main person is, that's who's going to die. Like she actually. And that's true in. Four of the five preceding gotcha. stories. Got gotcha. you. Now, do I think it's any coincidence that inside the stagecoach are five people? One of them being a girl, a woman, huh. the other four being men, huh. or the fact that there is a body on the top of the stagecoach that is unidentified, and we never see who's driving the stagecoach. Now, I'm maybe reaching here a little bit, but death plays a huge role throughout this entire film. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. It could be interpreted in this last scene, in this last short, that you know where, where they're going as a stagecoach is not just another town or another hotel. They're passing on to somewhere else, possibly. We don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wonder if there's meant to be some uh, connective tissue there. It just seemed a little too ironic that the last film of this whole sequence, which, which of the whole film, kind of seems the most heavy-handed of most all. heavy-handed, and it's dealing with death. Mm-hmm. I think, which the whole film has been dealing with death. I mean, we have a main character early in the film that you don't expect to die, dies, you know, early on. You've got deaths all the way through. And then here we are in a stagecoach, five people in a stagecoach, one unnamed body at the top. I I don't know. It's just a little too coincidental, the numbers and the makeup of people. I'm really disappointed in myself. The whole purpose of our podcast is to analyze stuff and analyze movies. And I feel like I've missed the boat on... The last no. two of the four, because my reading of Gal Who Got Rattled, you know, wasn't where yours was. And I like your reading a whole lot better because there's makes it more substantial. If that is the true intention of The Mortal Remains was to try and basically be a framework for the five previous <laughs> films before it. And the fact there are five people in the stagecoach and like. You don't see the stagecoach driver, which you could say is the director. Like, yeah. that's all very interesting. That, there again, it, that reading saves this last story. Now, I'll it say this. Makes me appreciate I've, it a lot more. I have not read any analysis to make me think that that's the case. That's amazing. This is just purely me. The, the, where it doesn't hold up is I cannot, other than the one female in the stagecoach. That holds I can't, up for me. I, well, I can't match the other four. Oh, I don't think you have to be that. Well, but I do think there's got to be a little bit. Now, I'm I'm trying to reach and see, all right, even the countries they're all from. Well, you've got the Englishman, the Irishman, and the Frenchman. You've got the lady, and you've got a trapper. 
Right. Just, I'm trying to figure out how they all connect, if there's a, meant to be a connective tissue there or not. But Well, without going into spoilers, yeah. I don't think we can analyze this too much more. No, you're I, right. Now, I'm, I would be kind of excited to do that now. Yeah. But, um, huh. Maybe there is. I, I just think the number of people and the fact that they chose to put this film at the last film right. and where these participants are going and the fact that we've seen death so prominent throughout all the other f- short films, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. I, I want to, after this recording, I want to read up more and see if there's another yeah. theory on that or if I'm just making something up just to try to find a theory. <laughs> um, I just thought it was a little too coincidental. I'm like, why make this one the last one? Why make this the last thing we see in the film? So if I, I, I yeah, I, I think it's, mm-hmm. I think for all the reasons you're saying, I don't see where there's any other explanation. You've solved it. You're inside the okay, cool. mind. We're good. I think done have to be. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Well, overall assessment, Chris, it sounds like you were not a big fan of this film. No, but the the two that I had the lower opinion of, you've now turned me around. Well, I think it's worth discussing a little deeper and maybe uh, reading up some things on them. But um, I I generally, I think I like this overall experience more. I got something out of each of the the, the six films. Um, Again, the last one's my least favorite, probably, but it's mainly because I was looking for more, and maybe there is more there I just need to dig deeper on. Sure. Um, but I, I do think the sequencing was a little off. You know, if I had a chance to go back and say, hey, listen, here's a different sequence you may want to consider, <laughs> I probably would have tried to, you know, the fact that you put your two funnier ones, lighter ones at the beginning, the beginning. I would maybe sprinkle those in and maybe put, I think having the, the, uh, the gold one in the middle is still good. But maybe you could have moved the James Franco one to later in the in the film and kind of balance those out a little bit more. Could have been a way to do it. Um, but anyway, overall, I had, I had a good time. And we talked for a really long time about it. So obviously we had a lot to <laughs> chew on. I, I had a good time with it, though. But I do think it was good that it came out in a Netflix film, not in a movie theater experience or not as a series type of thing. I don't think it would have worked in either of those situations. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I'll have to have to ponder that one a little more. Oh, we'll be discussing that one a little bit more, I think. Now, <laughs> so uh, that's going to be our homework is to try to re- read up more or analyze more about those last those last couple. Okay, so that is the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. It is on Netflix. If you've got the ten dollar a month Netflix plan, it's ready for you right now to check out. I would say if you're a Cone Brothers fan, yes, you need to go check it out. If you're not a Cone Brothers fan, if you don't like their previous work, it's probably not going to work for you. Because I do think this caters a lot more to fans sure. than it does non-fans. Wouldn't you right. agree with that? Right, which is, like you're saying, probably the reason it was released to Netflix as opposed yeah. to doing a wide release in theaters because they kind of knew, yeah, this is more of a niche-type film. It's definitely more it's, it's more of a true Cone Brothers experience than maybe some of the last few films. True Grit, you know, they put out as a Western. That had a lot more accessibility. It was a lot more kind of uh, for a, a larger audience. Larger, Hail Caesar was much more. Hail Caesar a little broad. bit more. This one was definitely more niche Coen Brothers fans. So, Okay, let's take a quick break since we've reviewed our, our main two films. When we come back, we're going to do a couple news items, uh, and then we'll move into some recommendations for the episode. So stay tuned. You're listening to Foot Candle Films here on the TheMesh.TV. We'll get back to your show in a moment. Just a reminder, you're listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Find out more at themesh.tv and give us feedback on what you like. And now, as promised, back to your show. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on the TV. As a reminder to everybody, this is our ongoing film series podcast on the mesh.tv network. If you're interested in going back and listening to old episodes or just finding out what the heck these whole podcast things are, visit the mesh.tv. That's T H E M E S H.tv. You can not only find our show, but you can find other shows that are on the mesh network, all are free able to listen to on your audio device of choice. The great thing that makes a podcast a podcast. And believe me, I know people will put up audio files or conversations and say, Hey, we created a podcast. Well, not really. A podcast is something that's ongoing series that you can subscribe to. So the idea is that if you like any of the shows, you want to make sure you catch any new episodes that come out, 
you need to, to subscribe to that show, just like you're setting it on a DVR on your home TV to make sure every new episode is delivered to you when it's ready. So use your podcast player of choice, whether it's your podcast app on an iPhone, whether it's a, a Google Play app uh, that does podcast, and I think other SoundCloud, other services all do um, um, uh, do uh, uh, Stitcher Radio. All of those do podcasts as well. Find your tool of choice, subscribe to the show, and that way every time a new episode comes out, you'll get it to listen to. Listen to it while you drive. Listen to it while you work out, whatever it may be. It's there for you, and it's free, and it's some uh, some great information on different topics. So I uh, hope you'll continue to listen and subscribe if you're so inclined. And uh, we appreciate you just tuning in for this episode of Nothing Else. All right, so Chris, let's uh, go into some news items. These sure. are some movie news items that we want to discuss a little bit. And the first one I want to bring up to you is, uh, don't know how this is going to go over, but let's just give this a shot. Oh, Okay. Um, we have not been very fair, maybe to the transformer films, <laughs> to a film that's coming out here in a couple of weeks called Aquaman. Oh dear. Yeah. See, exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> you and I have both been pretty down on where the direction of these films are going. We have not I, uh, been big fans of, you know, I the want de- suicide squad to be good. You want a suicide squad to work. You know, both of us thought we probably found a little bit more in the whole Batman versus Superman, maybe than the other critics did, but we still th- said it was a, not a great movie. I hated justice league. Oh, I, yeah. It just, you know, it's just not working. And now Aquaman, nothing I've seen in the trailers has got me excited for this film. Nothing looks interesting. It looks like just more of the same, just more heavy CGI. Wonder more, Woman was the only thing. That yeah, DC's Wonder Woman was good. Right. Wonder Woman was good. But there's been so much bad. But listen, Chris, <laughs> let's you and I reflect on ourselves for a minute. Okay. Because you and I, you know, we've seen a lot of movies. Yes. We have been, I think, more right than wrong when predicting how a film is going to be based on what we hear about it or see about it. Sure. If we had to look at a, if we had an overall scorecard. I'd say you and I are better predictors of a film's quality than we're not. I'd like to think that. <laughs> no, I think I think the history bears us out on that. Okay. But we've been pretty negative about Aquaman, but it has premiered in different places, done some sc- screenings at places, and right now the reaction's all very positive. I've seen a quote, and granted I didn't look to see who the byline was from, that it was like the most fun comic book movie in years and i was like huh interesting and i don't know if they were just saying that about the dc universe because that has been kind of a takeaway that a lot of people have complained about the dc universe has seemed to be more dark and they're not having any fun and everything's been kind of depressing um so yeah, the reviews it. i mean granted now you always have to take these reviews of the grain of salt sure people who go to early screenings of films typically will come out with a much more positive reaction because they got to see it at a world premiere screening or they got to see it with the directors or filmmakers there or something. So you've got to take that with a grain of salt. But I will say, when you compile all of the early reviews and early accolades for this film, they're all pretty positive. Now, what they're <laughs> that saying... That is a surprise. <laughs> well, it is a surprise. What they're saying is that it's, it's really impressive world building. It's weird. It's one thing I hear a lot of people say. It's a very weird film. Now, I like weird. Yeah. They say there's some like really strange, interesting, weird moments that make it really entertaining. Okay. They also say it's funny, which is something we haven't gotten a lot in the other DC Universe films. You know, I'm having to reconcile that with everything I've seen trailer-wise that has just got me so not interested. <laughs> the in trailers film. have just gone, continued to go down, down, oh, yeah, down. I agree. <laughs> like, I agree. Just keep getting worse. Even worse. the point where my kids and I, when a trailer comes up for that film, we're just like, ugh. Like, we all kind of roll our eyes and just <laughs> exhale now at the I've same time. I've got to sit through this, too. <laughs> but... I don't know. I and you know, maybe Chris, maybe this is like trying to teach us a lesson that you know, maybe. don't judge a book by its cover. Well, it could be that, the whole know. Pirates of the Caribbean thing, the could first be. film that I was just like, that looks like garbage. Why would I want to see that? And then it turns to be pretty good and actually so starts a franchise. So. I'm to a point now where I may venture out to go see it the first week it opens and just just curiosity. Ooh, that's a big stand there. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe willing to make <laughs> it that does, stand. Does it open prior to Christmas? I believe so. Okay. I think it's like mid, mid December. Okay. I, I will say this. Um, Jason, Jason Momoa, who's yeah. Aquaman. He's an interesting fellow. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing him in the bad batch mm-hmm. and he, I could see how he could really, and you get little hints if you can call it that in justice league where he kind of has these one liners kind of, in a way, kind of like the Arnold Schwarzenegger thing, mm-hmm. where he's this big, beefy dude yeah. who you know will say these things and kind of have this twinkle in his eye. I don't know. I mean, I, I think if Aquaman works, 
it's because of him. Could be. Um, but we'll, we'll have to see. So I'm, I'm just here to say I'm, I'm willing to give the film a chance. Okay. I'm always somebody who, you know, I try not to build too many preconceptions of films, but there's a few that are just way too easy to do. And this is one this for is me one. where it's been very easy for me to have a negative reaction to it. However, if I'm hearing from people that, you know, hey, it's actually really good. And it's I love the idea of it being weird. I, yeah. If they're willing to go and do some interesting, daring things with it, I'm all for it. Um, so we'll see. Well, speaking of, you know, hearing movies being talked bad about or sometimes yes. having preconceived notions and you being <laughs> somebody who's willing to give it a chance. Okay. Like you're going to give Aquaman a chance. You gave Creed 2 a chance Creed recently. Creed 2. And this is, you know, the film Creed was done by Ryan Coogler and starred Michael B. Jordan. Coogler has stepped away, I guess, in the Black Panther universe now. And stepping into the director's shoes is Stephen Capel Jr., and he's doing the sequel. Uh, Tessa Thompson is a loss also along for the ride, as well as Sylvester Stallone. Alan, you have seen this film. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, all right. Well, let me let me let me reframe it back to you. Sure. You you mentioned to me, I think, in passing the other day here in the hallway that you kind of wanted to wait to hear my thoughts on Creed two before you decided whether or not it was something you even cared to go see. Yeah, because I, I, Rocky movies. Never really uh, did okay. it for me. Well, Chris, I have an exercise and I liked, for you. I liked Creed. We well, reviewed it here on the show. Let me let me walk it. you through. I've created a, a flow chart. Oh my goodness! Like it's like a de- <laughs> it's like a decision tree flow chart okay. about whether or not Chris should go see this movie. Okay. So here, just bear with me if you could just answer sure. a few a few simple questions. Okay. First question: Did you love Creed, the movie Creed? I know you didn't, so you can say no. No. Okay. I mean, that's I fine. liked it. I that's liked fine. it though. All right. I well, liked it a lot well, more than I, I thought. We're getting it was. there. So if you had said yes, okay. your decision tree would have ended, go see Creed 2. Go see Creed 2. Done. Done. Okay. okay. You said no, okay, which I expected. So, okay, did you at least enjoy Creed? Yeah. Okay, I expected that as well. So if you had said no, the answer would be don't go don't see, Creed see Creed 2. <laughs> Fair enough. But you said yes, so we're going to go to the next branch. Okay. Did you enjoy any of the original Rocky movies? Yes. Okay. Oh, interesting. Um Tell me, okay, if you had said no, the answer would be don't go don't see go Creed 2. Uh, so tell me your I'm feelings sure, about Rocky just... Four, the Russian, the fighting the Russian with Drago. Did you think it was bad? Did you think it was goofy fun? Or did you never see Rocky Four? Okay, so Rocky One and Rocky Two loses into Rocky One, wins the end of Rocky Two. Yes, they're Rocky, both with Apollo Creed. Right. Yeah. Apollo, Rocky, three uh, Rocky Three is Mr. Is Mr. T. T. As and Rocky Clumber Four Lane. is the guy from Russia. Yep. Um, I think I saw the first four. I don't think I ever saw the fifth movie. That's, that's fine. Um, or saw Balboa. So what did you think about stuff. Rocky Four, the Russian one? Did you think it was bad, or did you lean more towards it being just kind of goofy fun? Goofy fun. Okay. Whereas All I right. think Mr. T was kind of goofy fun too. Maybe. Yeah. All right. Well, with goofy fun. <laughs> The you that are at the, the end subtitle, of the that was the subtitle of Rocky Three, right? Sub, like Rocky Three colon Mister Goof, T, goofy, yeah, Mister <laughs> T, T, goofy, goofy fun. fun. Okay. Um, the end of the tree for you is go see Creed Two. Hmm. Okay, now if you'd said I didn't like Rocky Four, I thought it was pretty bad, then don't go see Creed Two. Okay. Um, if you had never seen Rocky Four, my Dolph question: Lundgren is in this one, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you had said you'd never seen Rocky Four, then we would have gone to a sub question about What's how do you feel about you? how do you feel about <laughs> Michael B. Jordan. And if you oh. like Michael B. Jordan, then I'd say go see Creed 2. Uh, best thing about Blast P- Black Panther. Okay. I mean- All right. So here's the thing with Creed 2. I'll just kind of sum it up for you. Okay. Um, it's not as good as the first Creed. I mean, sequel- but it's different. sequelitis, It's I different. Guess. It yeah. is definitely skews more towards the original Rocky movies with this, which okay. is going to be some people are not going to like that. That might be problematic. It's a little more me. formulaic. It's a little more predictable. Hmm. Okay. However, I thought it was a lot of fun. Okay. Um, if you're willing to go in and just have a good time with it, it's fun. And I'll tell you what makes it good is the characters are still rock solid. Michael B. Jordan's really good. Creed, Adonis Creed, not Adonis Creed, but his son is really good character. Okay. His girlfriend, Bianca, played by Tessa Thompson, oh, yeah. is really good. His stepmother, played by Felicia Rashad, is really good. Okay. Um, and they were all really good in Creed. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So all those same elements carry over. Dolph Lundgren is really good <laughs> as the old Drago. Uh, it is Drago. It, it is uh, Drago's son mm-hmm. is a boxer. Mm-hmm. And basically the plot brings us to a point where Creed is now heavyweight champion of the world early in the film. 
And to defend his title, he has to fight um, Drago's son and becomes a big media circus. And just like Rocky Four was, the same because idea. Because the whole thing was Drago killed his yes, dad. Right? Drago and Adonis Creed had an ex- big exhibition fight, America versus Russia. Right. And uh, Drago killed him right. uh, by beating the crap out of him bad. Right. And so now here it is 30 years later and it's like. Oh, look, you know, Drago has a son who's this big fighter who's really good and beating everybody in Russia. Hmm. And here's a lot of money and here's a way that we can make it. So Creed sees it as a redemption thing. Drago also sees it as a redemption thing. Very interesting little subplot you learn about what happened af- to him after the film, uh, after the Rocky Four. That could actually be a saving great, like, maybe. It's interesting. It's very interesting. And uh, mm-hmm. there's a couple little surprises of people who return from that Rocky Four film that you don't expect to come back in as well. Hmm. So I think it was a lot of fun. I had a great time with it. It's not as good a movie as the original Creed. It might be a little more fun than the original Creed. Yeah, I wouldn't say the first Creed was good, but it wasn't fun. Yeah, so it was a good, a solid movie. Fun. This one's a little more crowd-pleasing fun. Okay. I will say the audience afterwards broke into applause in my theater. <laughs> okay. um, awesome. My two boys and I, uh, all it's the first time I can remember all three of us all simultaneously getting a little misty eyed in the theater at the same time. Okay. In the, uh, the last moments. I have a guess as to why that is. But. Yeah. So it's uh, I think it's worth seeing. Is that predictable? It's what I'm thinking probably, right? No, no, it's, it's not that it's not some big twist or some, some character or whatever. It's just the way it kind of caps oh. everything together at the end. It's just nice. Oh, okay. It's a nice, it's okay. a nice moment and it works. Hmm. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I liked it. I recommend it. But again, follow my little decision tree. And, you know, there it's, are some paths that would tell you the things, not there to are go there. So many movies coming out right I now um, that I want to see. I probably will see it at some point just because of. I think you. your son would like it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I probably will see it just because of what you said. Um, I'm curious, though, and this would. <laughs> this is probably. Are we going to have a Creed 3? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> No, it's it's totally going into franchise territory uh, it now. Is? Okay. Yeah, and that's the one thing. Just know that going in. No, going in. This is a franchise well, building mm-hmm. thing. It's going to follow a lot of the same peeps the Rocky films did. And I think that's why I liked Creed so much was because it was kind of like it was a dead franchise, and it was like I would have really liked it if it would have been a one and done type thing. Yeah. It's like no, we just wanted to give this spin on it, and we thought we could be really creative, and I think you were. And then to do this, it's like you're no, saying no, it's you're kind right. of hedging back. It is the, it, that is the disappointment. Territory. That is the disappointment with it is it's not as inventive. It's not as kind of genre breaking as the first Creed was. Um, if you remember, Ryan Kluger did a, a wonderful one shot um, during one of the fight sequences in that film in Creed. Yes. We don't have anything that rivals that. Like direction so wise, you feel like you cinematography. Can really tell Kugler has stepped away, and somebody else yeah, has stepped in. The film doesn't have the same raw energy that the first Creed does. It doesn't have that same directorial style to it. Okay, this is a definitely a much more audience crowd pleasing, genre filling version of the of the story. Hmm. However, knowing that and being okay with that, it's good. Okay, so that's that's my take on it. All right, I had a good time. That's all I can say is I enjoyed it. People ask me afterwards, did I like the film? And I can honestly say, yeah, I had a good time with it. It was fun. Fair so, enough. Yeah. All right. Sylvester Stallone wrote it, by the way, I believe. Oh. Or helped okay. write it. Helped write it. Okay. So uh, that may be part of the reason why it's a little more formulaic <laughs> so, <laughs> and seems to echo a lot of Rocky Four so much like it does. Sure. Um, all right. And so that was, yeah, the last news item I was going to mention for you, Chris. Okay. Uh, because Aquaman's almost here. We mentioned that one. Creed's already been out for a week or so. So we talked about that. So let's talk about a film, an idea, a concept that is still a ways off. Okay. But I'm, I'm sorry. I read the description synopsis for this film and I'm now fascinated and I cannot wait to see this movie. <laughs> okay. Have you heard anything about the film Pickle? No. Okay. Seth Rogen is attached to a film called Pickle. And again, you know, you hear about films that stars are attached to all the time and, you know, but is he writing it directly? Um, I, is it animated? It's not animated. So it's not like the one that um, he did with, the, I don't think he's, I, I can't tell if he's writing it or he's not directing it. What was the one that he did about the food in the grocery store? Oh yeah. Like, I can't remember. Oh, what was that? I saw it. <laughs> yeah. I saw it too. And I didn't really care for it. So, um, this one's being directed by Brandon Trost who is his first film as a director, but he was the director of photography on both Neighbors 
and the disaster artist. So he's had some, he's worked with Seth Rogen on some other projects, but just listen to this story, this, this synopsis. And this comes from birthmoviedeath.com talking about it. Actually, Deadline is the one who put together the synopsis. Okay. Rogan will star as Herschel Greenbaum, a struggling laborer who immigrates to America in 1918 with dreams of building a better life for his beloved family. One day, while working at his factory job, he falls into a vat of pickles and is brined for 100 years. The brine preserves him perfectly, and when he emerges in present-day Brooklyn, he finds that he hasn't aged a day. But when he seeks out his family, he's horrified to learn that his only surviving relative is his great-grandson, Ben Greenbaum, who's also played by Rogan, of course. A mild-mannered computer coder whom Herschel can't even begin to understand. (laughs) Hmm. All right. I'm totally on board with this. Because, A, I love the concept of an actor playing himself in two different time periods. Murphy, Dr. Doolittle thing? um, (laughs) Well, it's the uh, the clumps. The clumps, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Seth Rogen's doing a clumps, uh, so I'm all for that. On board. <laughs> I love high concept films, uh, and this is definitely a high concept story. So I'm kind of excited. Although I read the first paragraph of it, and it was talking about 18, 1918 struggling labor. I'm like, yeah, whoa, they're going like thing. really serious on yeah, this. Really and then he gets brined in pickles for a hundred years. I'm like, oh, okay, now we're back. <laughs> so, <laughs> now we're back. <laughs> anyway, I just thought it sounded really interesting. I'm kind of excited um, now. I, yeah, <laughs> and I wonder if this is going to be like Seth Rogen's like family fair because it seems like it could very much be like watered down comedy like Adam Sandler doing water boy well, or something. Like, now here's the thing. Not that that's a bad thing. Maybe it'll be really funny and really it good. It could but. go one of three different ways. Okay. I feel like a, this could go family fair. Yeah. You could make it kind of light and funny and kind of, Hey, isn't this funny? This guy from the 1918s is now Rogen hasn't really done family fair yet. Not right? really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sausage party. That's yeah. the movie. <laughs> there really we go. Not, not family fair. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> It could go family fair. Could be the Eddie Murphy stage of just doing movies that are just going to appeal yeah, to like is, a big family yeah. audience. It could go dumb comedy. Yeah. Hey, I'm a guy from 1918, and what's all this computer technology, technology. and finagled <laughs> stuff? Okay. Or it could go kind of serious. I mean, granted, the premise is kind of bizarre and wild, but imagine. I mean, you could play this as kind of a little bit more of a, a drama. I mean, here's a guy whose kind entire like a family, Button type thing. yeah, his entire family's passed him by. He's now in a different time period, trying to connect with a great grandson. I don't know. You could go really different ways with this, which is, I think what's also kind of interesting with the premise. So, huh. um, I'm, I'm excited. Of course, I'll probably see the first trailer and it'll look horrible and <laughs> that's fine. But, um, I'm, I'm ready to go. I say, bring it on. I'm always looking for creative, original ideas in film. And yeah, and I love the name works. of the movie. Yeah, Pickle. <laughs> I want the movie poster to be Seth Rogen in a giant pickle jar, like, you know, with all these pickles around him and like his face is green and like he's yeah. like holding his breath. Or exactly. Like that. Yeah. Now, I will say that technically they say the film is still in search of a title, but listen on IMDb is oh, listed as Pickle. I know it's, it's got to be, be called Pickle. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Don't call it anything but Pickle, please. No. Pickle. All right, so that's our news item. So Aquaman may be good. We'll see. <laughs> um, Creed 2, I think, is fun. Watch, but just go in knowing that you are going to be looking at a franchise film and pretty formulaic and predictable, but still a lot of fun, I think. And then Pickle, please keep that name, and I hope to see how this film <laughs> turns out. Me too. Chris, we're going to move on to our recommendations. This is where you and I both share a film that we think would be worth seeing. Uh, especially as we're going closer to the holidays, it's a great time to go ahead and just kind of be stocking up some stuff on a watch list. Um, but I will tell you the truth, Chris, and I've mentioned this in past episodes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the holiday season because it'll give me a chance to catch up on some films I need to see because I need to replenish my recommendation, recommendation list. <laughs> right enough. now, my recommendation engine is pretty low, meaning ah. I'm kind of out of films. I feel like if I'm recommending anything now, I'm kind of dragging the barrel a little bit. And I don't want to do that. Got gotcha. you. To me, I've got to recommend – for me to recommend a movie, it's got to be like three and a half stars or higher on a five-point scale. And right now, if I had to pull up some ones, it would be in the three stars or so, which gotcha. I don't want to do that to our audience. I so I'm going to cheat. Understand. Okay. But I've got a reason for the cheat. Okay. Do you mind if I go ahead and go first? No, go first. Absolutely. I'm going to recommend a Netflix TV show huh. for a couple of important film-related reasons. Okay. okay? One – as we talk about the film Widows, 
Yes. Some of the things we even mentioned in our review is that, you know, we like all the storylines. We like, you know, the interesting things with the characters. We just felt like it was trying to do too much in a two hour block. It would have done better as a story, as a series. Well, I've got an answer for you on that. Okay. There is a series on Netflix called Ozark. Don't know if you've heard about it. I have heard of it. It just finished up its two, second season and I've just finished watching its second season. Okay. It is kind of exactly what Widows could have been stretched out as a, as a series because it's a lot of very similar themes that are going on. Okay. People very. getting into situations a little over their head, uh, a lot of characters with some different motivations and, and, and trying to uh, play different games with one another. So imagine kind of a Widows stretched out over a couple seasons but you're setting it in the uh, Missouri Ozarks. Got you. And you're starring Jason Bateman and Here's Laura Linney. one Lenny. of your favorites, Jason Bateman. It, and I'm, that's another reason I'm recommending this series, because if you have any doubts of Jason Bateman as an actor, you need to watch this series. And I would say you got to stick with it till the second season, because he really, uh, he's really a good actor in this show. He plays very much against type. I mean, it's this is a guy that is in a very difficult situation. Basically he's a financial advisor and he gets kind of mixed up with the wrong crowd in his business. And by doing so, he has to relocate his family from Chicago out to the Ozarks. And he's got to launder like $500 million in order to keep his family safe and appeal, appease a drug boss. It's very tense. It's very violent. It's very dark. Um, but if you go in watching it from an acting standpoint, it's it's really, really strong, I feel like. Okay. Now, I'll also say another thing from a film movie related thing, someone we need to keep our eye on. Uh, there's an actress in this series, uh, Julia Gardner. Okay. She plays Ruth. Um, is that the daughter? Wife? No, Ruth Langmore is, there's a family called the Langmore family that okay. father is a criminal. Okay. She's kind of got her own issues on things. Uh, she's got nephews and brothers and they're all just all tied up in a lot of bad stuff. And <laughs> okay. she plays a very critical role in both seasons. Okay. She's a fascinating character and the actress playing her, Julia Gardner is really, really good. So I'm anxious to see what she's going to be doing. Cause I mean, she's got, she'll be doing something in movies if she's not already. Most of her work as I look at her IMDb pages on TV so far, but okay. I think, just like if somebody's really good in, in TV, eventually they find their way into a movie at some point. Sure. She's definitely worth watching out for on that end. <laughs> um, she plays a very interesting character and uh, excited to see what she'll do next. So I say watch it for Jason Bateman. Watch it for Julia Gardner. Um, Laura Lenny's fine. Um, <laughs> 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 you know, the rest, I mean, the cinematography is really great. It's all very dark and a very blue tint to everything. And kind of this real, uh, a little bit more of a noir feel to it. I just think it's a really sharp series and uh, it ended its second season on a pretty solid note. And uh, as much as these series that you know are going to keep going, you know, as much as I'd love to see complete closure, I know they've got to leave some plot lines open for next season. But right. so I'm cheating. Yes. To watch all of this, you are looking at probably about 25 hours <laughs> worth of watching. Okay. So it's not, you know, for the thing, it's not for the week of heart. It's not for somebody who just needs a film for a couple of hours. But if you've got some time and you're ready to invest into a new show, I do think there's a lot of film-related interest in watching this to see what Jason Bateman does as a dramatic actor and some other future stuff. Got you. And to watch Miss Julia Gardner uh, see what she does as well. So. Okay. Sorry I had to cheat. Give me a couple more weeks <laughs> to catch up on some more films. I'll have some others for us. Okay. What about you? What do you have a recommendation well, for? Uh, we, as the Foot Candle Film Society, just recently started a classic series, and we brought Citizen Kane. Are you recommending Citizen Kane? You're not, I are you? I am not. Um, you got me excited just for a second there, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> um, and it was a chance for me to kind of go through uh, Mr. Wells' filmography uh -huh. and try to, you know, he's somebody who's well-respected. A lot of people like him. And I watched a bunch of his movies. And, you know, I just – he's not, he's just basically – he's a miss for me. Um, and then coming to his most recent one that Netflix had picked up, his last film was supposed to be his last film but never got finished – other side of the wind, the trailers that Netflix have been throwing out there on social media made me think, hey, this this is going to be it. Mm -hmm. This is going to be my Orson Welles film that I love. And the reason I've never loved it is because I never got to see it. But Netflix has made this possible and crowdfunding also made it possible. This is going to be it. Well, mm -hmm. that didn't quite work for me. 
it was interesting, and I think mm-hmm. people really like Orson Welles. They should definitely seek it out and see it. Okay. But that's not what I'm going to recommend. My right. recommendation is actually the documentary that Netflix released along uh, with The Other Side of the Wind called They'll Love there. Me When I'm Dead. Yes. Uh, it's by Morgan Neville, who also did uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor this year. Um, so he's got two competing mm. documentaries that could very well be in the race at the end of the year for the Oscars. Um, he also has already won an Oscar with 20 Feet from Stardom. So um, the documentary basically you know, talks about the final 15 years of uh, Orson Welles' life and mm-hmm. the, what he went through to try to get this movie made, talking about funding, coming and going, actors going in and out the door. Um, and the, the thing that adds the extra meta level to this whole process is the story of The Other Side of the Wind was a film about an aging film director, director trying to finish his last great movie. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what The Other Side of the Wind ended up being for Orson Welles because he struggled to get it finished. So it was kind of like the movie was the story of itself. It's just very – and he claimed the whole time, oh, the character in The Other Side of the Wind, that's not me. It was played by Jason Robards. And he, even though it you know, it was very, had very similar things, oh, he kept saying, that's not me, that's not me. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, Orson, it, it's clearly got to be totally you. Like, there's no yeah. way – um, so just this documentary is able to take a step back and I, I just, I found it fascinating hmm. and it has some aspects of if there was a movie that I tended to be more in sync with that Orson Welles did, it would probably be F is for fake, All right. which yeah. I need to see again to see if mm-hmm. I appreciate, I think I appreciate it, but I'm not sure. Um, but there's aspects of this documentary that are kind of like that, like what is it making up? What is it really real? But Orson Welles did that himself. Yeah, he was, was always kind of, kind of his a man of mystery. And yeah. So you never knew kind of what was true, what was not true. And so this documentary just, you know, it was just, it's really fascinating and made me appreciate, even though I may not appreciate his body of work, definitely made me appreciate uh, Orson Welles more. Um, and the fact that, you know, which he admitted to in the documentary would say, yeah, it's like he makes this in Kane and then never recovers from it. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's just there's if you are the least bit interested in Orson Welles, I would check out uh, the Love Me When I'm Dead. It's on Netflix. I mean, the interesting thing too is should you watch Other Side of the Wind before you watch that documentary? See, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, that's I I watched Other Side of the Wind first just yeah. because I didn't want you know Love Me When I'm Dead to spoil anything. Sure, and right. I don't think. I don't think it would. Okay. So I, I don't know that. So you're not required to watch one before the other. You could watch them independently, but uh, right. But I guess okay. maybe I am giving a double recommendation because it is a very fascinating pairing. I think if you just watched Other Side of the Wind and you didn't care for it, watching the documentary may make you kind of hmm. understand some make context and bit. get more out of it. It's definitely an interesting double billing. Okay. So, um, but I'm I'm going on the record as just recommending. They'll love me when I'm so dead. So they'll love you. Love me when I'm dead is your official recommendation. Yes, with a sub recommendation. Sub recommendation. <laughs> other side of the wind. Correct. Both on Netflix. Both on Netflix. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Netflix. I know. Tell you what. It up this episode. You know what? <laughs> if uh, as much plugging as we're doing for Netflix, if you have any interest in sponsoring uh, our show, uh, let us know. We'd love to. We we'd love to talk to you. <laughs> I think we might have a few sponsorship <laughs> opportunities open right now. There you go. So, all right, Chris. Well, I think that is wrapping it up for us for today. So, review of Widows which we both liked, although you a little more positive than me, but both of us are still very positive on sure. the film for a lot of reasons. The Bow to Buster Scruggs, I think I was more positive on than you. You liked certain elements. But you may have brought me around on certain Maybe. other elements. We may have to revisit <laughs> so, that in a future episode. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I think is well worth the time to watch. And Chris says, you know, at least a couple of the pieces are definitely well worth the watch. Yeah. Uh, Aquaman could be good. Don't know. Going to wait to see. Creed 2, I think, is a lot of fun. Uh, we got Pickle, hopefully, staying as a, as a film uh, going forward, title-wise. And then our recommendations, Chris, with his uh, They'll Love Me When I'm Dead documentary about Orson Welles and the making of Other Side of the Wind on Netflix. And mine is on Netflix, Ozark, the TV series, watching uh, mainly for Mr. Jason Bateman and uh, Julia. Well, what was the name I just said? Shoot. Julia, oh, I'm sorry, Julia Gardner. Okay. Julia Gardner is the Julia one Gardner. I'm recommending you watch for. So, 
Okay, Chris, it's a lot we tidied up there. Uh, a lot of opinions may be floating out there from listeners based on the various things we talked about. How, uh, how can they talk to us if they want to share those opinions? Best way is to send us an email at info at the mesh.tv and just mention for candle films in the subject line. Tell us how we were right or wrong about the six different segments of Buster Scruggs and maybe how Neil Ticket was the best thing ever. You know, it could be. Um, but just uh, send us an email and uh, we will try to respond to you. Also, Alan and I have accounts on Letterboxd where we try to semi keep up with the movies we're watching sometimes we rate them sometimes we might even give a simple description but those are ways you can try to keep up with us i would be remiss if i didn't say our festival which we do as well with the film society uh, will be in september of 2019 but we are already accepting submissions you can go to footcandlefilmfestival.com and mm-hmm. there will be a link on there that you can uh, enter your work if you are a budding filmmaker and are interested in uh, learning more about our festival yeah, absolutely. So we'd love to see some films submitted. Now's a good time to submit because uh, before it, it kind of gets into the late uh, the late deadline fees. True. And um, yeah, we had a great festival last uh, in September. We're looking forward to another great one this next coming September. So if you are a filmmaker or have uh, uh, connections to filmmakers, please help spread the word. We'd love to uh, consider your film for the festival next year. All right, Chris, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. I hope everybody had a great holiday season and Thanksgiving. We'll be talking to you before the next holiday uh, with another episode between now and then. Um, But, and then I guess we're getting close to the end of the year. So we got to be starting to look at end of the year stuff after uh, December as well. So we're getting close to that time. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. We'll look forward to talking to you next time. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.